here to talk to the incredible human Lisa Marie McDonald of Sweet Bear Rescue. If you don't know who she is, her rescue, her sanctuary is just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. She has been a speaker at our events multiple times, especially the one in Asheville. Actually, we have her sanctuary as a sponsor of our education day, which is actually really cool. Hopefully it'll happen this year on October 10th. We were just talking about that. But Lisa has done talks in Asheville, in Knoxville, and other places. I know it's more because you were trying to be a, I, what was it? Was that the... I in, I did a interview for you as vouching for you for that. Yeah, it was like a women keynote. Yeah, a women's leadership conference where they asked me to be a keynote speaker, but that is they had to put the pause button on that as well. So right. So I mean, because you know, because she's awesome. So she's done her talk about happiness, and this is uh, that's her thing. She talks about happiness when she comes to these events. But today we want to talk about. Let's see. What it's like to run a sanctuary during a pandemic is one of those things. What happens with the animals? What the need is for donations during this time? Because as a not, of another person who runs a nonprofit, I'm more than aware that no money is coming in. Yep. Because it just stops. And then you have these kind souls out there who are still donating. Thank you. Because it's happened for me. I'm sure it's happening for you as well. Trey just said that he loved your talk in Asheville. I'll put that up there. I love Trey. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and there's Hannah. Let's Hi. See. Hannah, <laughs> let me put her up there. Hey, Hannah, thanks for joining us. This is awesome because it's cool because we both know. <laughs> we both know both the people, of these people. to say hi. And that'll, that'll segue pretty well into the fact that you can post comments and you can ask questions throughout this video and we'll put them on the screen. We'll answer them as quickly and best we can, especially if we're in the middle of talking about something else. But Lisa is uh, just an incredible, incredible human being. Uh, there's the Tara, she's over in Greenville, which is awesome. So, <laughs> well, she's an incredible human being who I've been very fortunate to know and when I was able to, like, I have no words. When I was able to do the, I have vouching comes to my mind, but I was able to get on the phone and give my opinion or what I feel about you so that you could be the keynote speaker for that women's conference. I pretty much was like, I mean, I cursed. I was like, she's effing awesome. Aww, that's so <laughs> right. Sweet. So, I mean, how do you, I mean, what's, you know, what am I supposed to say? I was like, they were like wanting more specifics from me regarding you, but I was like, that's not really how I function. Yeah, I don't I'm just really gonna like... throw out some expletives <laughs> right, that right. really capture was... my emotions. <laughs> I was like, well, what did she speak on? I was like, well, they just speak. I, I want my speakers to say, say things to the public that I think you think they'll find interesting. I don't micromanage my speakers. I let them be who you are. And, I'm and then very you do who you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to like to speak off the cuff too. So I don't really, I mean, I take some notes, but public speaking is one of my favorite things to do, especially on issues that mm -hmm. I believe the world needs to talk about more. Um, not only veganism, but depression and mental health and staying sane, especially in these times where, you know, the world has, has never been this crazy in my lifetime. So. Exactly. And you and I are, I, the same age. So we've lived the same amount of time. I think you might have a year on me on this <laughs> planet. So, huh? so let's see, it's a really good segue. So I, I know that you've given the talk on happiness at Asheville when you were the least happy person on the planet. <laughs> And, you know, at the time, no one knew, like no one, I guess, who was close, uh, wasn't close to you, knew that you were giving a talk about happiness and you were putting on that face so that people could, you know, learn from you. And then, you know, I know you've somewhat publicly come out with uh, what's going on. We don't have to talk about that, but I want to talk about we can. I think yeah, it's really, well, you know what it, is, it is a really important subject because there are people who are quarantined right now with people who they are not happy with. Yes. And it could be dangerous situations. And you were fortunate enough to get out of your situation, even though it took probably longer than you anticipated. And I know it wasn't easy. So if you want, you can go from there and share whatever you feel comfortable with. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to just give a bit of a background about how I came to be in the situation that I'm in with two businesses and an animal sanctuary and this nonprofit called um, Kindness Empire. So my, historically, I was a business consultant. So it was a very, I love you too, Afton, so much, girl. Um, I was a business consultant, and so my life was very kind of high stress, very buttoned up, super conservative, a lot of pressure. I was making a lot of money, traveling a lot, um, but it was just this crazy, crazy lifestyle. And I was mostly working with Fortune 50 companies, and I was just kind of making rich businesses richer. And I would come home from these business trips, and I would just like foster as many animals as I could. So I think in the span of a year, I fostered over a hundred kittens. Um, I was just constantly like trying to live my truth while I was home. And then I would go on the road and be this completely different person. So my entire life was like this pendulum of like, this is the business version. And then this is the person that loves animals and wants to care for them and promotes veganism. Um, hi, Kristen. <laughs> so about five years ago, I was talking with my partner at the time. Sorry, my headphones keep falling out. Um, and I said, wouldn't it be cool? And he was a brewer, so he makes beer. So I said, wouldn't it be cool if we could open a brewery and then make a bunch of money and turn that into an animal sanctuary and just start this rolling kind of thing, this rolling empire. And so the very next day we copyrighted Sanctuary Brewing Company. And then we opened that business about eight months later. So I completely left this corporate world that had been my whole life for about 25 years into something I knew absolutely nothing about, which is entrepreneurship or running a small business. I, I mean, a brewery, I had no idea. I just kind of like leaped into it. And the only thing I can compare it to is like jumping out of an airplane um, just with a blindfold on. It was terrifying but it turned out to be successful. It really resonated with the community. It went from being something that advocates for animals to something that advocates for all living beings. So we started doing a lot with our homeless community, giving out free haircuts, making free meals, et cetera. And then it kind of turned into a community center in a town that is pretty conservative. It was like this one beacon of like a place where people could get together and not worry about being judged for who they are, or how they identify, um, as a gender or what their clothes look like, all of these kinds of things. So we just really wanted it to be a safe space. So that was in 2015. And then in 2017, I did exactly what I had set out to do, which is open an animal sanctuary. So that was my second business, which is a nonprofit. The overall um, nonprofit is called Kindness Empire because I knew I wanted to branch that into multiple things. So animal sanctuary was gonna be one piece of it. So that was the first piece, and that is Sweet Bear Rescue Farm, which is on the farm that I live on. I have three acres just outside of Hendersonville, North Carolina, with 45 animals. Um, I predominantly rescue chickens because I feel like chickens need the most rescuing on the planet. And I'm also very um, in tune as to how much space I have and what I can feasibly do. Like, um, I wouldn't bring in an animal if there would ever potentially be a situation where I couldn't do best by that animal. So I've got on this farm that I share a home with um, dogs, cats, pigs, chickens, turkeys, and goats, totaling 45. So it started as like a micro sanctuary. And now it's turned into something that's not so micro, but it's awesome and amazing. And I love it. So the presentation, Helene, that you were talking about, I gave last year I, I believe it was in June, and that was two months after I had broken up with my partner. So the person that I started Sanctuary Brewing with, the person I had been in a personal relationship with for 12 and a half years, that relationship ended. So literally, I felt like everything in my life was just bottoming out. It was the scariest thing I've ever done, the hardest decision I'd ever made, but it had gotten to the point where it was so dysfunctional, I just needed to get out of it. Um, so. What I, I didn't want to be a victim and I didn't want to go to bed and not get out of bed for a month, which had happened to me in the past dealing with some other tragedies. So I just kind of took a hold of it and started listening to podcasts about mental health and started reading books about positivity. And if anybody is interested in um, some of those references later, just let me know and I'll, I can let you know that the people 
whose books I've read, podcasts I've listened to that have really, really helped me. Um, so that's kind of where I am right now. While that was going on, I opened a restaurant inside of the brewery. So now I've got a restaurant in the brewery with my ex-partner and the whole thing is just kind of a convoluted, very tangly mess right now. But every day I'm like untangling it a little bit more and coming out of it on the other side. Um, so I'm still in my home. Animals are doing great. I'm so grateful for springtime right now. Um, and one thing I'll say up front while we're just talking about kind of the mental health issue of it, I'm, ne I'm not going to pretend that I don't have bad days or that I don't go to bed and stay there for two days sometimes. The biggest difference for me right now in my life is that I know that these are temporary moments in time. So I think what happens to a lot of people in depression is they feel like they're just never going to come out of it. It feels like your life is never going to be lifted back out of this like deep, heavy weight. And at my worst, I know that it's fleeting and I know that there's impermanence and that there are moments in the future that are going to bring me boundless joy. Um, and living here with these animals, that's that's honestly, I that's what they do. Um, they give me endless joy. Here's pipes. <laughs> these pipes. Yeah, <laughs> by my side. So that's it in a nutshell. So whatever you guys kind of want to talk about um, as far as that stuff is concerned, if you want to talk about safety measures around running the sanctuary or what it's like living with all of these different creatures. I'm also quarantining solo as a human. So while I have a lot of people in my family, I'm the only human person. Um, so the conversations with the animals get weirder and weirder by the minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we're entertaining. I love you too, Evan. Yes, Evan. <laughs> He's the, just the best. Makes me laugh every day. Um, so yeah, what do you guys want to talk about? So I mean, it's it, I'm not alone in the house, right? So I've I we're three humans and and three dogs and two cats. And fortunately, we all love one another. I mean, obviously, the animals could be little shits at times, but. You know, outside of that, humans wise, we're very fortunate that we love one another and we get along. But I do think about the people who are alone. And I, as, as introverted as I am, this is not, as I've said this previously, this is not a difficult thing for me. Actually, all three of us in the house, we're all introverted people. So this was like what we were already doing, except that we do events <laughs> or right. save my house, maybe we'll go right. to work. Right. So this is, normal. And I, I hate to say that because it almost feels privileged to say like, the days fly by, the days fly by for us. And for me, especially, like I almost like can't do the things I need to do, because I'm so good at passing time, that I feel sorry for somebody who is extroverted, who is going out of their mind right now. Yep, me too. So I mean, you're on your own. But you're on your own with a whole not your whole menagerie of yeah. animals to yeah. give you a purpose, to give you reason, to give you you have to get out of bed. You you've got other lives you have to take care of. Yep. That's exactly right. So I would say about two months ago, I had a few caregivers. Um <laughs> Thanks. Your listening. hair looks great. <laughs> I did my hair for the first time in like a month and put makeup on. So anybody who wants to Google chat after this, please hit me up. I think <laughs> is my first date when this is over, but I'm getting them all out today. Um, so anyway, a couple of months ago, I had some caregivers living on the property and my depression was so bad that they were doing like most of the caregiving for me. And that is in some ways the worst thing that can happen because I do lose my motivation in those times. So the fact that right now I'm here by myself and every day I wake up because I love the people in this house so very much. And now I'm just focused on them. Like I'm not worried about my restaurant. Helena and I were talking about this right before we started the call. Um, so for me, this, there's like this horrible thing happening in the world right now. And there are so many beautiful moments that are a part of it. I am in this serene place with people that I love where I can really focus on them. Um, and a thing I was doing before this even happened was never bringing my phone out to the feeding. So if I am spending time with the animals on the property, I never bring technology. I want to be fully present and in the moment with them. 
And since this is it, like I, all of these major distractions are kind of gone and I feel so much more present. Um, and in some ways like this horrible tragedy for so many, I'm just trying to find like the silver linings or where there are little gifts. And for me, it really is just kind of being here with them. Um, I'm reading Trey's, Trey's message right now. Dealing with the uncertainty yeah. of time, I think that's what a part, it, okay, so that is a very good question. So I'm I'm trying not to forecast out too far because I think, and I hope, and I pray that what the world looks like a month or two from now is going to be different than what it looks like today, that we're gonna come out of this wiser and kinder and more compassionate, um, safer, more respectful to people in the medical profession or people that do what I do, small business owners, et cetera. I really, really want that to be the case. And then in the meantime, what I do is just practice safety to the nth degree. Another thing Helene and I were talking about was biosecurity. So I will Google things like how long does COVID-19 live on different services so that I'm aware. So I've got a handful of people around here in the community that are helping me out by doing my shopping. And then I have sanitation stations that are outside of the house. So if you know how long the virus can live on cardboard versus plastic versus steel, then you can kind of figure out when you can bring things in. Um, and that's been really helpful to me, but I am like, full-blown lockdown and have been for just over a month. Yeah. So just think, thank you, Hannah. Hannah, by the way, who just commented is one of my favorite people in the universe. I love her so much. It's ridiculous. Um, so yeah, so it, just don't look too far out. Kind of try to find those beautiful moments every day. Try to find things that are hilarious at least once a day. So my yeah. recommendation today, I posted something on Instagram, which is an SNL video from like nine years ago that literally just made my life. Um, and another thing I love is the Sarper Duman Instagram. I don't know if you guys follow him. It's S-A-R-P-E-R-D-U-M-A-N. And he is basically a man in Turkey that rescues cats and he plays classical piano for them. And they have these like bonding, loving moments together. And it's just one of those things where if you think the universe is a sad and scary place, um, just look to the true love between two different species and how incredibly beautiful it can be. All right, not knowing how long life will be this way. That's another thing that Helene and I were just talking about. I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody knows. So concentrating on it. So here's what I'll say about that. Okay, so a thought pops into your head. Is there anything you can do about it? Yes or no? If the answer is no, just just let it go. Um, oh, thanks, Kellen. Um, I guess I think if you just ruminate on something that you have no control over, it's not going to get you out of the loop that you're in. So literally when that thought comes into your head, just as say, okay, I see this as a thought. It's separate from me. Do I have any control over it? Is it helping my life in any way? And if the answer is no, just move on. I mean, we don't know how long life is gonna be like this. Um, just like I said, you have to try to find something beautiful every day that makes it count. Um, and, it, and you know, I tend to go up and down pretty drastically um, in terms of fight or flight or depression or how well I'm doing every day. And it's okay to embrace the bad days and not talk down to yourself. If you wake up and are having a really rough day and you're like, I just can't today, then don't. But the conversation to yourself should be, but tomorrow I will. Today I'm going to give myself a break. I mean, I think loving yourself first, doing what you know is best for you um, is being respectful to the human that you are. And without being respectful to yourself first, you're not really gonna be beneficial to anyone else. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I hope so. No, I think it was really helpful. And also Trey, I, I, I agree with Lisa in regards to, I'm a control freak and no one who knows me. I couldn't do what I do without being the control freak that I am. See me at one of my events, my people at my table tell me to go away. Fair, I, I get it. I'm better than I was seven years ago. So we can only control so much. We can't control 
We cannot control things we cannot control. Yeah, it's, I'm surprised they have a bark on my end. You, a <laughs> rooster started crowing and then a dog started to bark. Right when you said we can't control things. Right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry Harmony. It's there's raining, so Harmony's in the house today. He's mad at me. Harmony, my rooster. Uh, there's actually nothing we can do. I mean, they, we, we, yeah, it's, we, has, we just have to, like hope for the best and it's such uh, try to keep as positive an attitude as you can understanding that we have a lot of things that are out of our control and the things that we can have control over influence over influence them is one of the best things let me just put this up there is you know because find people like least to fill your cup which is you know, that's, <sighs> After true, that's true you're ridiculous her and i had a long yeah, I know. chat yesterday she is another one of my favorite people so, so Evan is from Cotton Branch. Yeah. And yeah, so he's got a great question is what we can do to help animals during social distancing. So, so there you go. Yeah, to clarify, do you mean animals that need to be rescued or animals that are already living with us? Because they, I mean, I, I I think you would agree with me, the animals that are already living with us, it's just <laughs> enrichment. <laughs> I have so much time on my hands right now, which hasn't been true in like 20 years. This is, it's so bizarre for me to wake up and be like, I can do anything today because I've, you know, I own three businesses and that's consumed all of my time and it's not right now. And for 20 years I was consultant and I'm not anymore. And so I, it's this, it's like a rebirth for me. It's very, very strange. And again, like I said, beautiful. Um, in terms of rescuing animals, like that cow video, Evan, that you posted the other day, which is just, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it was a group of people came together and saved a cow that was gonna yep. drown. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, for animals on the property, definitely enrichment. So Harmony, who you hear in the other room, is probably crowing because he's not watching his iPad right now because his programs ended. So when we're done here, I'm going to go put the iPad <laughs> back on so he has something to watch because he's trapped in the house today. And then just making like homemade puzzles and toys and playing different music and seeing how they interact to those things. So much cuddle time, it's ridiculous. Um, rescues, I think if you look to people like Trey Morrow, who's on here, who's one of my rescue heroes, I, I would tend to defer to someone like him who does more like field rescue than I do. I tend to stick on the like sanctuary networking, who has room for this animal, can you help transport and that kind of thing. Yep. <laughs> 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 Levy, this guy just a really great question to laugh to. <laughs> okay, so I am currently, so here's what I would do, Melissa. Here's my advice. And I told this to a friend of mine yesterday, I actually posted it on Facebook. Every time somebody says or does something completely insane right now, I screenshot it and I am calling it my Facebook quilt of the demise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to stitch them all together and be like, this is how crazy some of us are right now. Um, but if people are posting pictures of dead animals on Facebook and you don't want to unfriend them because you do understand that we're in the minority and this is normal culture and it's going to, everybody, you know, comes to things at their own pace. And even though this whole thing started because of eating animals, people don't want to change because they find so much comfort from their food. Just unfollow them for 30 days, do what you have to do. I mean, Pictures of meat completely traumatize me. So I, I don't unfriend people necessarily because I think that um, the posts that I put out really change people. I mean, I, I know people that have been like hardcore hunters, meat eaters, it's the manly thing to do that will private message me and say like, you know, your posts really mean a lot to me. And so whether or not we feel like being kind to them, I think that the carrot works better than the stick. Um, there's this philosophy I follow called the Lasado line, which means for every negative thing that you post or put out into the world, there should be a minimum of three positive things, but ideally five. So if you need to say, this is what's going on in animal agriculture and it's a sad and shitty thing, put it out there, but then put up five really uplifting, beautiful things because 
you're not going to isolate your audience that way. So you you want to bring people in and you want to feel inclusive and you don't want to judge them because let's face it, I wasn't born vegan. I ate animals for years. I had a belief system that I was an animal lover and I wasn't living my morals. Um, so people have to figure that out on their own. We can't bash them over the head to do it. But if it's freaking you out and traumatizing you, just unfollow them. But don't don't block them unless they're being really, really terrible because what you're putting out into the world can change people, whether you realize it or not. Sometimes people, I've gotten private messages from people that said, I've been following you for a year and thinking about this and I decided to try vegan a month ago and it's been great. So I had an impact on somebody a year ago and didn't even realize it. Exactly, or just keep scrolling. It's just like television, changes the channel. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to pause on what's being out there. I mean, it it could be considered for the political posts as well. Just don't engage and keep moving. I mean, I know that it could be. Uh, it's hard. It's not an easy thing to look at, but you can keep scrolling. And for a lot of us, I know we've got more people who are aligned with how we think and feel on our streams than we have that we don't. So I know for me, it's it's kind of intermixed but there's less of that than there is of you know all this stuff that's going on that we're all posting and lots well, of funny stuff <laughs> and i actually want to talk about melissa in particular because she is a person i absolutely love and the reason her and i are friends is not from activism it's from the the beer world and so being in the brewing industry and being females here's what we deal with on a daily basis big bearded burly men with like a turkey leg in one hand and a stein in the other. And the culture is very, very masculine. Um, and Melissa was a vegetarian for years and she would occasionally post on cheese or things like that. And I would never say anything negative because I was a vegetarian for eight years before I went vegan. And I don't see that as a bad thing. I see it as a gateway to going vegan. And I think when vegans rip on vegetarians, they're doing more harm than good. So what I tried to do with that friend was just say like, here's a little bit of information and a little bit of information. And about a year and a half ago, her and I got together and she was like, okay, I think I'm gonna do it. I wanna go vegan. Do you have any advice? And my advice was get a good therapist <laughs> because things <laughs> from, from vegetarian to vegan change in your mindset so completely drastically. I mean, it. I, I feel like it changes everything about you. So I think vegetarian is a diet and veganism is a way of just opening your eyes and living your truth. And there's something so profound and so beautiful about it. So she is a person I absolutely adore. I attended her wedding last year, which was 100% vegan. She is, so she's one of those people I'm talking about. She's an absolutely beautiful soul. Um, <laughs> yeah, the Dairy is Scary video is definitely a game changer. It's horrifying. Um, but yeah, so Melissa, who is a person who works in the beer industry, had a wedding that was completely vegan. Um, and it, it was awesome and amazing and everybody loved the food. And I think right now what she's going through is what I call the vegan arc, which is like in the first year where at the beginning you're like, this is awesome. This is the best thing I've ever done. And then three months later, you're like, I want to kill everyone. <laughs> And that's where the therapy part comes in. And you just have to realize like, yes, it's painful and walking through a grocery store is painful. And you know, seeing these people that you love do things that you cannot believe that they're doing that is emotionally draining and you have to get through it, but it does get better. Um, and I think <laughs> Melissa is probably in the heart of that right now. She's also brilliant and puts out these posts that are like super in your face and kind of like, if you wanna argue with me about this, let's do it because I know what I'm talking about. So I'm lucky to have friends like her. She's yeah, my hero. I call, yeah, I call them the newbie vegans because we all start out like, you know, when we first take on what we're taking on. I mean, I, I've said before, I was actually hanging outside of a, of a limo in Manhattan and when I was 19 years old, yelling at people that meat is murder, you know, just like driving through Manhattan doing that, which is, <laughs> it was so it was like not something I would do now. Yeah. But, you know, but I had turned vegetarian when I was 19. So, I mean, this has been 
uh, it, maybe it's been over half my life. I mean, this is over 30 years with this going into my ninth year of being vegan in October. Awesome. So yeah, it's been, it's been an ebbing and flowing, you know, wear leather, don't wear leather, animal right. rights, you know, animal right. activists, right. food, health. I mean, it came down to health reasons for me, I mean, which no one would think my main reason for going vegan was for health, but you know, uh, you can't, you can't do this and not like, if you really want to know where your food is coming from, then you look at how, it's, how the animals are treated and how the planet needs us to make these changes so that the planet exists for people's children and grandchildren, because we're going on a, in a rate where it won't exist right. for the future generations, which is incredibly scary. And then of course we've got a pandemic you know, going on, which I don't put out there so much that it started from animals because I don't really want to, people are, people are locked down in their homes right now and are very captive, but I don't want to take advantage of them being captive. So I, unless it comes up on my, in my feed, I, I talk about it, but I don't push it. So because everybody kind of knows already like what I do if they're if they're if they're not vegan on my stream of my of my social media they know that I am right so they know what I do but I just kind of lead by example and if you have questions you can ask yes so that that brings me to something I call like a strategic vegan versus a tactical vegan and I think the majority of us are tactical and what I mean by that is what we do and who we are as people is very emotional so we are part of a social justice cause where we are so very much in the minority and what we were fighting against is so very normalized that a lot of times we feel silenced um, and that can be very painful in relationships. But the farther you take that, it, but I guess if you knee jerk react to those things and you let your emotions sit on the forefront of it, you are being a tactical vegan. A strategic vegan is, are my actions right now helping or hurting animals? Is this response to this person helping or hurting animals in the long run? Um, and sometimes the answer is hurting. So if we are vegan for the animals and we are bagging on people who start out being vegans for health or being vegan for the planet, we are doing ourselves a disservice as a movement. I don't care what brings people into this group. Like I said, everyone is gonna find their path at their own speed. So let's be more strategic and inviting. Let's treat this like a business or a profession um, where we're trying to, change the world through influence, through social media influence, through conversations, through the way we eat, the way we look, the way we exercise, how healthy we are, all of these positive things that is going to get more people involved in this movement than you saying you're not vegan for the right reasons or you're a vegetarian, so you're still killing cows. I know that's true. I think that dairy is probably the biggest atrocity that human beings have ever put forth on the planet, but it is what it is. And most people don't realize that. And they don't realize that veal is nothing more than a byproduct of the dairy industry. But you know, you, so things like Ashley brought up dairy is scary. I would never just blatantly post that on my page. I will tell people, listen, I have a video I'd really like you to see. It's going to be emotionally upsetting. I can tell you how to find it, do it in your own time. I would never cram that down somebody's throat because it's horrifying. Um, and I don't need them to have a triggered knee jerk reaction because what happens a lot of times is people see things like that and they do use dairy products and they're like, you think I'm a bad person. You think I'm an animal <laughs> abuser. And that's not the conversation I wanna have with anyone. It really is just like education, learn a little bit more all the time and then live according to your morals, align your morals with your life. And if we're all doing that, we would all be vegan because the things that happen to animals, we don't wanna do, we just wanna buy them in a preset package where they've already been ground up and we don't have to see how the sausage is made. Um, so I think we can all do a better job of trying to be as kind to other people as, um, you know, looking at it as we were once in that space. I'm reading Trey's comments. Yeah, we're reading Trey's comments too. 
um, somebody stream out of that was people that are put off by them sometimes, but may open the door to talk to a calmer vegan. I'm going to say something that uh, Gene Bauer uh, resonates with me that Gene Bauer says in his, in his talks, because he, he spoke in a Triangle Veg Fest twice. I've emceed where he's spoken in multiple states. And yeah, one we of the spoke things at the same one two years ago. Mm -hmm. The triangle <laughs> in, in, in triangle. Yes. Yep. Our fifth year yeah. anniversary. He was my, he was my gift for triangle for our fifth year anniversary. And one of the things that he did, yeah. he's discussed and Leilani and he's spoke open about, that one too. yes, she did. And common ground. The most important thing that we can have with people when they disagree with us or are in a different poll than we are with what we're discussing or what we feel is to find common ground because we all have it. Sometimes it's very difficult to find it. But if you, I've watched Dean Bauer sit on a panel where one of the panel members was saying things that I could see in Jean's face, how it was hurting to hear the words coming out of that person's mouth. But when Jean spoke, he went right for the common ground and didn't attack and just kind of, you know, stood by what he felt and, and what he knows is the truth. And it's just it's just amazing well well he's like he's also another incredible human being who i'd love yeah. to get on here to have one of these live talks with so i'll put that out there into his universe um, his when energy we're done. is so unbelievably kind in person and not arrogant he is exact and he also i feel like the people that who have been doing this for a long time that's the approach they've come up with is find common ground be kind don't come off as judgmental he is masterful at it and it doesn't tray um to your point that doesn't mean we don't need to to point out the horrible things and that we shouldn't be doing protests etc it all goes back to that concept of the losado line which is like yes this is the true core information we need to get to but we also need to bring a lot more positivity to it because if we just bring the negative people are going to tune out and then we're just preaching veganism in a vacuum to other vegans because the rest of the world is like this is too radicalized for me or they get really defensive so here's a question from deborah so i'm really glad deborah's here she's also in north carolina and all oh, from yeah, she's from blueberry blueberry yep so how we communicate between sanctuaries tends to be criticized by non-vegans when there are discrepancies or disagreements between vegans or sanctuaries. We should try very hard to be more kind and selfless. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> One of the cats just walked up. Um, yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, Deborah and I were just at a conference together that actually Evan and Josh, Evan's on here, um, from Cotton Branch put together. And it really was just a way to unite this local area and let us talk to each other and meet each other. And there is... Um, an email stream that came out as a result of that. And I really think it's bonding and it's positive and it gives, gives great advice and everyone on there is kind and courteous. And I love that. And I, I mean, I think Evan and Josh are shining examples of not only how to run a sanctuary, but how to get us all to kind of respect each other and work well together. And another thing that Evan kind of started and I'm doing more of is visiting as many sanctuaries as he can. Let's see what we're doing and we can learn from each other. We can get great tips and we can give great advice to each other. So I think we're getting better at saying, let's not bash this person for doing something wrong. Let's figure out how we can help them do something right. And if you, I don't know if Evan has been on here yet, but he's pretty dreamy. So he's, he's a person. <laughs> I think we do very well on Group. I know. I'm not hitting at him just so his husband knows. That's true. So one that. of the things I one of the things I don't think a lot of people know, unless you know a lot of people who are in the sanctuary network, is that there is oh, best way to put this. I'm not gonna be politically correct. There is a ton of crap that gets thrown all your way. That is I I, I've I've been on the phone. I've gotten the phone calls. I've heard the drama. I I I try not to. Well, it's not my it's not my it's not my realm, right? I just produce events, right, and do what I do. But it comes to me via the phone or messenger or email, and yeah, it, it you know you don't until you know that there's all this stuff going on around. You guys aren't just taking care of animals. You're also fielding a lot of crap from a lot of people. 
and there's a lot of people who want to sling crap at you. And I, so I just don't, I, I honestly don't understand it because if you want people to take care of animals, like all the pigs that, you know, Evan and Josh have, have spearheaded to try to get homes for, right? Yeah. If you want people, if you want these animals to find homes, then let's try to support fun and do everything you can for these sanctuaries so that they have places to put these animals that need places to go. I mean, look at Gentle Barn. Gentle Barn helped cows in St. Louis and opened a Gentle Barn St. Louis yeah. because they helped cows there. So I mean, as Evan just said, I'll get to the other thing before that. I mean, the easy job is taking care of the animals. The public is what is difficult. Yeah. I mean, that's probably an understatement. And I, I totally understand as someone that works with the public, I probably have the easier side. I work with vendors more than I work with the public, even though they come to the event. My favorite part is working with business people because they they just know what they're doing and they tend not to be difficult, which I'm very thankful for. But I Honestly, know for you. <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but quickly, I, having a business background was the best thing that I could have brought into running a sanctuary, just in terms of being organized and treating it as a business. Because I think what happens a lot of times is people are like, I'm going to open a sanctuary and all the money is going to come in and it's going to be great. And sometimes that's true. And sometimes you're dealing with a lot of disease and you're dealing with death and you need to hold animals while their lives end. I mean, a lot of it is incredibly painful. Um, so figure out what it's all about before you get into it and treat it with respect, not just a passion project. And that's another thing I'm going to sing Evan's praises about it. Um, he was also very good at coordinating with other sanctuaries. So I'll say one more thing on that note. The, <laughs> and again, I, I, I need to figure out how I want to say this without um, <laughs> offending anyone. But for the most part, I would say 90% of people in animal rescue have the animal's best interests at heart. There are some personalities that are very savior complex. Um, and there are some personalities that are very, very saintly complex. So they're like, the animals need me. They could never function without me. I work 18 hour days. It's so exhausting. Okay, so here's, please don't do those things. <laughs> if you have a sanctuary, please don't do those things. Because I like to believe that we are on a tipping point. I like to believe that veganism is moving in the right direction. And everything I've seen in the last two years tells me that's true. And so what does that mean? That means we're gonna need more micro sanctuaries. And if you are out there telling the world that this job sucks, no one else is gonna want to do it. No, don't get into it so that you get praise for yourself. Get in to it because you truly love and believe in what you're doing. And if you complain about it constantly on social media, somebody that was thinking about maybe starting a sanctuary or even adopting another cat might just be like, well, no, if it means I'm broke all the time and I can never go on a vacation <laughs> and that I'm constantly covered in poo and I just sit home and cry and I don't have any friends, no one else is going to want to do it. And if you're living that way, figure out a way to get out of that lifestyle. Get care, people want to help you. Get caregivers, go on vacation. My Before the pandemic, my role was to try to sleep in a hotel at least one night a month. And that, the sole reason for that is to relax my nervous system. Because if while you are on your sanctuary, all you think about is keeping everyone alive and happy. There is no way around it. It's parented, whether you have human children or you have pig children, it's the same thing. Your life becomes about keeping them happy. <laughs> Thank you, Evan. So get out and go, go take a walk in a park that you've never walked before, sleep in a hotel room where no one is going to be on you or sweating or pooping or crying or any of those things, and then go home the next day. But you have to give yourselves a break. Coming from a corporate world, there are so many similarities in this mindset of like, if I don't work 18 hours a day, I'm failing. And if I'm not bragging about working 18 hours a day, then what good is me working 18 hours a day? Just stop. Let's normalize this. Let's make it normal. Rescuing animals is normal. Veganism is normal. We don't all have to be saints. We don't all have to be victimized. We don't all have to be martyrs. Let's just normalize it. Okay, rant over. 
No, I, I mean, I totally hear you. And the other really, really important part of the sanctuary part is to not grow beyond your means. Do uh -huh. not, I mean, you want to save every single animal. Hey, you want to save Harris. every single animal possible. Totally get it. I hear you. you. If you don't have the land, if you don't have the funds, if you don't have the capability, the mental capacity as well, don't do it. I mean, I've been talking to Lenore at Piedmont Farm and we're my heroes, like <laughs> Harmony agrees. The most difficult part of her day, she has said, is having is having to say no multiple times a day when people yeah. call to say, can you take such and such, such and such, such and such. You know, that is incredibly difficult because the first and most important people or humans or species that you need to pay mind to are the ones that are already in your care so I, and not the one that needs your care i love that you said that because this is my so my thought process whenever i get contacted about taking in an animal is this it's not about that animal it's about the animals that are already part of my family and is there a potential to negatively impact them so is this animal going to take away food health care money um, safety, structure, bedding, et cetera. And if the answer is yes to any of those questions, I don't do it. What I try to do instead, he's, <laughs> Harmony is like super into this right now. Yes. What I try to do is plan ahead and say, okay, based on where I am right now with my budget, um, my location, my space, my time, I think I can take on three chickens or one cat or one pig, et cetera. So I make that decision first. Then when it comes up, I can easily say, no, I'm sorry, it's not in my capacity to do it because I've already thought that through. So family first. Right, and don't <laughs> don't think, don't take on an animal to fun, and then fundraise to take care of that animal. Well, that's that just another a form of commoditizing an animal, which is the opposite <laughs> of what we should doing that's exactly what you're doing people who say like if you i brought this animal in and if you don't give me money i'm not going to be able to feed it or you know get it neutered or that's emotional blackmail and i just no it's a we all have to be good at asking for money you have to you yeah. have to ask and you have to be truthful i mean you know i like i said i'm going through this very serene time in my life where all of this pressure has been taken off of me but it's also the first time in my adult life where i don't have any money coming in at all <laughs> so i have a mortgage i have 45 animals i don't have a nickel coming in and i need to be honest about that but that's not saying look at this pig and if you don't send me money something horrible <laughs> is going to happen to him that's not we it, it's commodifying an animal that's not cool Yep. Exactly. So speaking of which, because we've, uh, we're almost at 50 minutes, if somebody wanted to donate to you, how would they go about doing that? How would they find you, Lisa? So you can donate um, through PayPal. It's paypal.me slash kindness empire. So if you guys were right at the beginning, I said my overall nonprofit is called kindness empire because we do more than just animal rescue. So paypal.me slash kindness empire um, the sweet bear rescue farm has a donate button on the page i started a gofundme because um, during the pandemic they're matching if you, if you can raise five hundred dollars they will match that um, for a random number of sanctuaries and then venmo is kindness empire no space so lots of ways, and trust me when I say, we, I mean, we could really need your help right now. And shout out to, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, it was so bad. Um, you know, I've been working with all of my utility providers and my mortgage lender and applying for everything, the EIDL loans, applying mm -hmm. for all those things. And a few other sanctuaries, a few other large reputable sanctuaries. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. They. <laughs> They found, people I don't know found out about our struggle. And then these other sanctuaries started putting it in their um, Instagram stories, Facebook stories, just saying, hey, Sweet Bear could use some love right now. Please help them out. Um, and that is the most beautiful side of it. That is unbelievable. Um, Caitlin from Blue Chases, she, 
um, put out quite a bit of social media to try to get us some help. And that got us a lot of things purchased off of our um, wish list on amazon.com. So another thing you do, smile.amazon.com, it's kindness empire. And then there's a sweet bear rescue farm wish list. So anything on those items would be great too. But uh, yeah, we're going through some lean times just trying to keep it positive and I'm very fortunate. And here, I'll show you one more time. My bestie, she's always here with me. <laughs> cat butt, cat. I know, she doesn't want to look at the camera but. for whatever reason, but she's always <laughs> next to me. She is the one in the picture. I know, there's six cats here, but I'm kind of partial to this yes, one. Yes, do a picture that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we all um, have our so, favorites, I know that. And you know. I, I, you can say that you don't, we all know you do. <laughs> So I, I agree with Shrey. Thank you for all the incredible work you do. Uh, you make a difference to the world for, and for the animals and for the humans, you know, because you don't just help animals, you help people as well. You know, when you do your talks, because I know everyone who is giving you positive reviews when you have. So Thank you. this has been, I mean, we could probably go on for hours, but I mean, for someone to rewatch it later it would probably be, <laughs> it'd be like, well, how long is this? Uh, I know. <laughs> Which is kind of cool because it's like people are just sitting in on us catching up, you know, and you know, things that we would talk about typically in person. Yeah. That if so we get to see you, you, you know. I know. I love you, Helene. I, I love mean, you too. To, you're the best. And your reputation in this industry is stunning. I've had so many people come up to me and just be like, see, this is how these festivals should be run. And I'll tell you one thing right now Cameron Osteen adores you. I love Cameron. I love him so much. <laughs> He's such a dreamy human being. He, when I, like right after my breakup, he, Asheville Vegan Fest last year, he stayed here with me for about a week and it was exactly what I needed. It was like this angel of a human being that yep. we just, you know, sat on the porch and had coffee every day and talked about life and it was beautiful. And a lot of it was about you and what you do for this movement and how professional you are and easy to work with and just wonderful. So thanks. And thanks for letting me just talk and talk and talk while I drink white wine out of a mug. <laughs> Which now everybody knows. <laughs> no secrets well here. Put it, in, well put it into a wine glass next time. Happy. <laughs> I, I just drink out of jars or whatever, like pickle jars, whatever <laughs> I can find these days. Well, well, thank you, Trey. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you to everyone. You know, everyone who's been on here, Hannah, Evan, Gina, I mean, I have a friend that was on here who is who is not vegan whatsoever, and that's Fred Pickett. So I really Hi. appreciate Fred coming in and watching. Hopefully, he stuck around for a little longer. So you just you don't that's what you said. You don't know Satara. You just don't know who you'll reach with what you do and what difference you'll make for the people that you encounter or you post about or. You know, that's why I produce events. It's a warm welcome hug for the community to come or people to come and see what what a festival looks like that just happens to be all vegan right. or plant-based because we've also included the plant-based network in this. So just a couple of things about what we're doing. The plant-based network, you know, you can see on Roku and Apple TV and on their website. And that is a a network dedicated to plant-based with education and cooking classes. And so it's very light. It is not, uh, it's not animal cruelty type things, not dominion. If you want to think about it like that, it's more forks over knives this. So okay. with, I'm on the, I'm on the advisory board for them. And then of course, Triangle Veg Fest and Veg Fest Expos will get back to in-person events maybe hopefully this year, I really hope so, in October, November, hopefully August even. So we'll see where the world goes to, and that goes to what Trey was saying. I've got my whole nonprofit's livelihood is in the hands of doing live events, in-person events. And without them, I, I can't even think about what would happen to the nonprofit if I have to, um, it could bankrupt the nonprofit to have to give back all the vendor fees of which many, much money was spent already because the events were already in motion. Five events of my six have been opened, you know, at the time that this all fell apart. So I'm just kind of just cycling and, and, and creating a virtual veg fest. And so yeah. that's what's that's what's coming up next is uh, virtualvegfest.com and it is we're adding vendors and we're getting ready to promote it and we're going to feature a a theme of kindness 
is going to run through it, which is going to be really cool. So that's what's going on on my end. I totally get it. A nonprofit is nothing coming in. I won't take money from my vendors. I say, if you want to pay for your vendor spot for an event that may or may not happen and you're okay with that money moving forward, I'll take your money. But if not, you have a spot, we'll, we'll, re we'll reconvene when we know it's going to happen because that's my integrity. I won't just take your money, you're even awesome. though it would help, you know, but I've had one vendor actually uh, donate. The one vendor donated their, their vendor fee back. Which I was totally thank you. I love that. So, so thank amazing. you so much. And uh, yeah, it, it's it's been you know this. I I I have faith in people as much as there's like really crappy people out there. I have a ton of faith in people. I see it enough in everything that we do and the interactions that we have with people all the time. So and and I see terrible, horrible stuff too. But I see more. I tr I have to I have to do the half class full. It, it, yeah. especially now I have to do the half glass full thing. I mean, we were up playing Wii until like two 30 in the morning last night. I mean, that's, it's like so much fun. Who can, you know, we, you know, we can do it. <laughs> so I, I'll say one kind of dorky, but also awesome thing about that. I, I read this guy, Sean Acor, who I love. He wrote the, a book called The Happiness Advantage. But I think in one of his podcasts, he brought up is the glass half empty or half full. And so for everyone that says half empty, he just pans out the picture and there's a pitcher of water next to it. So you can mm -hmm. always fill up your own cup. You just need to make sure you have those resources. So yeah, someday your your glass is going to be half empty, but it's what I was talking about earlier. You know that it's impermanent and it's going to get filled back up. Oh exactly. That's such a Hannah thing to say. <laughs> she, you're such a beautiful unicorn of a person. I actually want to shout a couple of things out. The picture of me holding Piper, Hannah took mm -hmm. that picture. It's maybe okay. my favorite picture in the world. It's as close to having like a birth announcement I will ever have because literally I'm like, look at Piper, she's perfect. Um, and the other thing is in my background, I slyly put Leilani mm -hmm. Munter's race car, which was her birthday gift to me when I turned 50, which was a while ago, believe it or not. So I love you, Hannah, and I love you, Leilani, if you're here so very much. That, these are the people like in my network that keep me sane. Um, Leilani makes me laugh more than just about anybody every single day. So having text threads going with your friends who are like-minded and can make you laugh and make you feel like you're still, like you have some human connection, as Hannah said, believe in humanity. They're the people that like in my darkest moments, that's what gets me through it. I, you know, I have these people where when it's really bad, I can text them and say, it's really bad right now. And I know I'll get something valuable out of it. So use your network as much as possible. And just like when you have a sanctuary and you can't be afraid to ask for money, don't be afraid to ask for help. People love you and people really do like helping. So let them. That's true. That's very true. And you know what? I, I think I can speak for you in the sense of that you don't have somebody that you can reach out to us. Most yeah. of us are, are just those people. We're the, we're the helpers. You found the helpers by listening to this. So reach out to us. We'll help. So sweet. Even if we don't have, I mean, I've offered help and I don't have, you know, I'm like, well, if you need help, I'll help you. I mean, or if you I'll just want to be sad and you need somebody to complain to. If you're like, my whole family is not vegan and today sucks and, you know, and you just need to get it out to someone instead of punching a pillow, you can message me. <laughs> if we're not friends already, message me. We can we we'll talk through whatever it is. It's okay to, like I said, those rough days are fine. Just so long as you know they're impermanent and that tomorrow you're going to do things slightly differently. So if I have days where I'm like, I'm just going to stay in bed. Once I make that decision, I will say, but tomorrow, here's what I'm going to do. And then I stick with that. And then tomorrow, it just kind of flips a switch in your mind where you're like, this is okay. It's okay for me to feel this. I know it's not permanent. Here's what tomorrow is going to look like. Right. And that, and that I'll put the caveat that that is for people who are uh, more mentally stable and healthy, as opposed to the people who are, have more issues with their mental health, because that yeah. would be way more difficult to, we know that you can't just flip a switch and wake up tomorrow feeling differently than you woke up today. Totally no. understand. Right. I just want to put that caveat out there that the, the empathy is there that we understand that you, you can't just snap. 
and no, be like, and it, oh, I'm better, you know? No, so. that's actually a great point. And another, so he, I guess it's more what I'm trying to say is that there is impermanence. So one of the great pieces of advice I got from a podcast was when you are on a roller coaster and you're like, this experience is amazing. And you get off and you're like, that was so great. You don't think I'm going to feel like this for the rest of my life. <laughs> right. But when you're depressed, you're like, well, this is it. This is all that's left. And so just having tiny conversations with yourself that are like, it's going to get better. I promise you it's going to get better. But I'm certainly not saying that you can magically make it better. Talk to your doctor, talk to a therapist, talk to your friends, reach out to someone. Um, don't ignore it and don't take care of other people in, in human or non-human before yourself. It's the whole yeah. adage of put your own mask on first and then everyone else says because you just you can't maintain it if you're not taking care of yourself first. Right. And right now put that mask on correctly. Yeah. Over your nose and over your <laughs> mouth and on your chin. Right. That's like really important. Arm the really animals mask. just came out with so Arm the Animals is a brand that I love and they just came out with masks, but they're like animal faces and they're yeah. super cool. So check them out. Yeah, well, thank you so much. This has been awesome. I don't know if I'll ever be able to do one of these. It's only 30 minutes. Uh, I thought the next one was going to be Milton Mills, but uh, it was you first because I just, I'm so addicted to this because of the public speaking thing. I was oh, like, yeah, oh. So Josh Lajani and Howard Jacobson have agreed to want to do one of these two. And uh, Dr. Betty Smith, who was the, the runner, the, the marathon, yeah. incredibly fit unbelievable cool. woman who also wants to do one and katia is another vegan athlete who wants to do this i mean you know when you know i've i've, I've actually asked dr gregor's people if he wants to come on and do this that really stop cool. trying to hook me up with dr gregor right <laughs> well oh that's what i was trying to say before we had to go live just i'll i'll put this out there at the end of this because of asheville vegan fest moving to october 10th and 11th weekend because knoxville was supposed to be october 11th and Dr. Gregor is coming to Knoxville, that means that Dr. Gregor, a uh, good possibility is gonna come to Asheville instead. Awesome, which is, okay. which is pretty darn cool. It's not 100% confirmed because he, it was Saturday, he can't come on the Saturday, he can only come on the Sunday, which means I have to make some adjustments to the outdoor, to the tent and chairs. But we could have Dr. Gregor in Asheville. That's <laughs> so, Cory Booker. I, okay, I've written, I've written to him, so, but you know what I think I do? I have to talk to Kendra and Marissa who have gone to like parties with him in New Jersey. I'll draw, I'll, I'll go that angle with Corey Booker. Okay, I would be so appreciative if you did. Great, thank you. Oh, no problem. Well, thank you everyone for watching. We really appreciate it. And for the questions, it's been the most engaging one yet. And, you know, spread it around, show this to everybody because, you know, uh, Lisa's not the only one that needs donations. Cotton Branch, Blueberry, I mean, Ziggy's, uh, Farm Sanctuary, Gentle Barn. We can go on. Um, cows Come Home, Farm Afton, Shire. with Pig, with, with, um, pig Preserve. Uh, pig Preserve. I mean, there's it, there's, there's, there's no one there. It, the list is unlimited. So even yeah. if you give $2 to each person, you know, you know, do, do what you can, if you can, right? Because every, any anything helps. Anything helps any of the nonprofits out there. Yeah, so, I mean, five bucks is a is a bag of pine flakes. I mean, that's betting for like three days. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah, everything helps. So, well, thank you. That's a great way to end. And, you know, we'll see you next time. After right? Calhoun. <laughs> exactly we got our vegan shirts on it's perfect all right have a great night everyone bye guys i love bye. you love you too lisa bye